Thank you very much, Harriet. And going to Roshanara, please, finally. Uh, thank you and good afternoon. Uh, I have a few follow up uh, points really to raise and perhaps um, Sir Tom and others if, if or on some of them I'd be grateful if you could write back to us because in the interest of time because I'm the last uh, person on the list to, to ask questions and I have quite a lot of questions on Brexit. Uh, so on the on the the furloughing scheme, when it was extended, there was a lot of concern about the last minute dot com approach to that, I'm afraid. So our constituents uh, were made redundant when that could have been avoided because employers had to act faster uh, earlier in order to give notice and go through the redundancy consultation legislative requirements. And it seems short sighted. Could you give us either now or a right to us to say how many people, how many jobs could have been saved if the announcement was made a few weeks earlier, given that the Chancellor has now extended to, to March uh, in terms of, I've got 50, nearly 50,000 people who have furloughed. Some of those people would have been made redundant that, that, and that could have been avoided. And that's a problem up and down the country. Um, so if you want to pick up on that, please do, but feel free to write. The second thing I wanted to follow up on was in relation to Eat Out to Help Out. Uh, you mentioned the back of the envelope point, but uh, one, one, of the, uh, one of the members of SAGE, along with the Prime Minister, said that it could have contributed to uh, higher infection rates. Uh, uh, that was Professor John Edmonds, and he's warned that if it's done again, that could be damaging. Do you have an, any plans to reintroduce it when we come out of lockdown? And if you did, do you, do you think actually it would have been better to have an eat in to help out scheme rather than eat out to help, help out and spend half a billion pounds and, and risk infection? Uh, and the final thing I wanted to, again, you can write to us alongside the points that Angela raised and Siobhan did, if you feel that would be, that would give you a chance to provide a more comprehensive response. The Treasury, you know, we rely on the Treasury to provide value for money and recognising all the challenges you've raised about a pandemic uh, and the unprecedented challenges officials have had to work under and ministers. The fact is that there is a bit of a pattern of conflicts of interests. Uh, between ministers and others who have jobs, who've got contracts, party political uh, issues around that have been raised in Parliament. I've raised them, uh, others have raised them. Uh, and also today's report by the Public Accounts Committee of £316 billion pounds of struggling England Towns Fund, uh, that not being impartial, impartially allocated by MHCLG. Um, you, you will probably turn around and say this is not your department, but there is a wider need for cross-governmental working to avoid what looks like pork barrel politics, to be frank, and that's not acceptable when our constituents are going hun hungry uh, and the Treasury can't find, couldn't find money to feed children during the holidays. And it took a footballer to run a campaign to get the government to make a U-turn. So I'd be grateful if you could respond to those points, um, some of them now and then some of them in writing. Thank you. Let, let, me, let me take each of those points in, in turn. So on the um, uh, extension to the furlough and um, uh, eligibility for that um, uh, and your question about the um, uh, people that have been made redundant um, in, in advance of that. The, the new date for eligibility under the furlough scheme is the 30th of October. So people who have been notified to HMRC at any point up to that time will be eligible to be furloughed under the scheme. And indeed, anybody who was made redundant before the announcement of the job support scheme in September the 23rd of September can also um, be rehired and put back onto the scheme. So I I hope that at least addresses part of the could, your could question. I, could I please have some data when you get a chance on how many people, how many employees actually did that, have, have actually gone down that route or uh, it, it, you know, actually had already pressed the green light and decided to pursue the redundancy. It would be really helpful to get some facts. Uh, at some point, C certainly, I'll be I'll, I'll be happy to to write um, on the question of the um, uh, eat out to help out scheme. Um, uh, as I said earlier, that was an attempt to uh, help re-stimulate economic activity in a safe environment, uh, in a way that would help support uh, jobs and um, 
uh, that's being it. disputed with respect. I heard what you said, but that's being disputed uh, by a sage member, but also by the prime minister. And uh, so we, the public needs assurance that you're not going to, the treasury is not going to do any harm. Uh, the do no harm principle seems to have been suspended. It is being disputed. We need an assurance that if policies like this are reintroduced, our constituents are not going to be put at risk. And I've seen examples where that has happened. Uh, what, you, 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 an assurance. You, Can you give us an assurance that if this policy is reintroduced in some form, the risk assessments are done, the impact assessments are done, so that we don't see an increase in infection rates? The Prime Minister himself has said that it may have done so. You asked whether there was any, there was any plan to, to reintroduce it. So, as you know, it came to an end at the end of August and there's not been any sure. further discussion uh, uh, of that. Did the Treasury do any impact assessments to see what the risks might be? Um, I can't recall precisely the nature of the advice that went into that, but the, 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 the basic point is that em employers and um, businesses have a responsibility to ensure that they're premises are, are, are COVID secure. And so th this was to be used in COVID secure premises. Um, but I, again, you, 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 you've asked for um, comments and writing and I'll, and I'll be happy to include Thanks, that too. And on, the, on the final point, would you be able to write to us alongside the points that Angela Eagle raised um, about how government departments spend money given the change in ministerial direction? There's a real concern, public concern, about waste of public money. And at its extreme, there's concern that money is going into the wrong hands and mi being misused. And frankly, uh, people are starting to ask questions about whether there's, much, you know, there, there's something much more serious going on. Uh, uh, so, as I said in, earlier in, in answer yeah. to Ms. League, I'll be, I'll be happy to check the okay. Cabinet Office, their view on compliance with their frameworks. I think it requires joined up working between the Treasury and Cabinet Office. Uh, and, uh, and the final thing I wanted to raise in terms of agenda items is, I'd be very grateful, I raised this with the FCA recently, if the Treasury, I appreciate the Treasury is dealing with the pandemic, you've got Brexit coming up, um, in terms of wh whether we get a deal or not and the implications if you can write to us about what the Treasury is doing with the FCA to try and address this issue about the EWS1 certificate for those who are in cladded properties where they're living in uh, potential death traps. I have the, um, some of the highest numbers of cladded properties where people can't move because they're not gonna now be given mortgages because the certificates aren't available. This is really a finance related issue in terms of mortgages alongside MHCLG. Again, requires joint working between the two departments and FCA. So if I could have some work done on that, I'd be very grateful. Just moving on to the Treasury, um, the, the points around Brexit. The Treasury, um, do, do you, would you say the Treasury is fully prepared for the UK leaving the, uh, the UK leaving the EU with no deal? Uh, and are there uh, any Treasury policy areas where immediate action is needed if a deal is not reached? Uh, thank you. On, on, on the first point on cladding, we'll certainly write on that. It's something we have discussed uh, uh, very much so with the FCA and it, you know, we're well aware of the issue and, 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 and I'll, I'll be happy to write on that. Um, in terms of preparing for the end of the transition period at the end of the year, um, obviously the Treasury's Direct responsibility, direct responsibility is with the financial services uh, for the financial services industry, and that is something on which we've done many years of work. We we uh, do a lot of that with the Bank of England, the Financial Policy Committee. Charles could add more on that, but we were um, certainly confident uh, last year ahead of the possibility of no deal, and this year ahead of the possibility of um, no no future agreement. Um, that the, the sector is, is, is robust and, and, and well prepared to deal with that. Um, most of the other issues that are being raised as potential um, uh, issues are other sectors and other departments, but we would certainly um, be uh, ready to do whatever was, was needed if, if um, you know, to support, to support other departments in dealing with their own particular sectors. So we've, we've been... Just picking up on, on that, uh, Sir Tom, uh, the, the, are you being asked to design financial support for sectors that are going to be most exposed to no deal, such as agriculture and, and uh, chemicals? Uh, well, we in the spending review last year, we allocated, uh, I think it was £3.6 billion to departments 
um, specifically for their Brexit preparation this year. Um, obviously, at the time that was allocated, which was last autumn, the, the, the precise timetable wasn't known, but um, departments have got have got that money. Um, and um, that, you know, that that's where it that's where it rests. There's a big, as you know, there's a big cabinet office exercise which is coordinated un, uh, under the chance of the Duchy of Lancaster, which looks right across the government uh, at preparedness. Um, but um, as, as, as far as we're concerned, we've, we've, we've already allocated that money uh, last year. Okay, and, and the forecasting, the economic forecasting that the government published on the impact of No Deal, uh, is that still a live document? Well, the, you, you, you're referring to the the, the 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 analysis published about two years ago, I think, on looking at the different possible outcomes. Um, uh, look, that 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 analysis is now two years old. It was prepared um, for a previous government, and it was also prepared under assumptions um, set by that government. If you look if you look at the paper, it says clearly that the 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 the, the, the assumptions underpinning each scenario were were, were set by. Uh, the, but there were no the deal. There were, so, there were assumptions made about what a no deal, what what the cost would be of a no deal Brexit. Is that still relevant? Is it is it still is it still live, or are those numbers very different? Uh, well, two things. First of all, uh, well, three things. We 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 haven't updated that assessment. Secondly, the assessment at the time was about a no deal Brexit, and obviously we. Um, that's now we've passed that point. We left the EU at the end of January with We're an agreement. Transition with respect, we're still in the transition period, and we could end up with a no deal or a series of mini deals, which I want to come come on to. Um, well, it, so just to pick up on no deal, that is still on the that is still there's still a chance of that happening. Uh, just because we're in the transition and we've left doesn't mean that 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 is no longer that is an academic point, is it? Well, I think it means something slightly different. Uh, two two years ago, when people were talking about no deal, they meant uh, they they meant literally leaving with no agreement at all, and that didn't happen. We left with a withdrawal agreement. You're of course right that there's a big question about the future agreement. Yeah. Um, but that I think is 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 different from what was understood at the time to be uh, to be no deal. The so third we, thing I'll say. It's an update, updated uh, uh, set of numbers then on what what no deal would mean what if, if you're saying it's those numbers are no longer live or relevant what what is uh well the, the third uh, thing to say is obviously with the, the 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 effects of the pandemic on our economy and the european economy and every economy has also considerably changed the picture um sure, but I, bet, I, get that, I get that but i think the significance of no deal shouldn't be underestimated just because there's an even bigger crisis on our hands and i you know we've heard some of those arguments being made elsewhere it just masks the, the fact that this is a big issue as well. So your department will have to deal with not only pan the pandemic, the second wave, but you've got the un 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 you know, unsavoury task of having to deal with the situation where we've got now, where we still don't have a deal. Could you say something about how you see things panning out? Um, and are we, are we expect should we expect a series of mini deals and where, uh what, what progress has been made there? So on 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 the on the economic analysis, uh, first of all, the bank last week in in their forecast um, uh, assumed a uh, transition to a standard free trade agreement with with some short term uh, friction, um, and they've settled that out last week. The the OBR will do as you know their forecast in two weeks' time, and they've said that they will have. Um, uh, I, I can't quite remember how they phrased it, but they will certainly look at different um, uh, Brexit options there. So we'll have that in, 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 in two weeks' time. Um, uh, in, in, in respect of the negotiations that happened, there's not very much I can say. They're not, being, they're not Treasury negotiations, they're Cabinet Office or Number 10 negotiations. And as, as the world has seen, they're, 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 they're happening in yes. conditions of um, secrecy, which is probably a good thing. Okay. Uh, um, I'm just going to hand over to Charles Roxburgh if you want to add anything. And I'm conscious that my time is pretty much coming to an end. Or anyone else for that matter. I want to uh, answer. Uh, Charles, did you want to add anything? Uh, nothing uh, to what Tom said. Uh, we are live working on the cladding issue you raised, and we're also continuing to work on the mortgage prison issues that we've talked about in the past. Thank you. And, um, uh, we uh, have an important report out today from the London School of Economics, which we'll be studying very closely. And uh, I know the Economic Secretary wants to 
take a very close look and, at it. And I'm very pleased to have um, Claire, my old friend Claire Lombardelli. Uh, did you have anything to add? And Anna as well on any of the points I've raised? No, no, uh, no. nothing in addition to what others have said, but, um, but thanks. Okay. Well, well, thank you very much. And I just want to say I'm very grateful to, to particularly to Charles um, and, and Sir Tom for the work you've done on mortgage prisoners following the issues we've raised, as well as picking up on this point about cladding, it makes a big difference to our constituents. So thank you for that.